All right, this is going to be the third part of the Garmin Montana Immersion series of classes. And we've already covered kind of the basic introduction of the unit, what it's good for, as well as going through all the setup menus in the second vent, uh, video. So now we're going to go through the actual tools or applications that you're going to use when you're actually using this GPS out in the woods and out on the bike. So as we kind of mentioned initially, is there's, there's a lot of things that GPS can do that you're not going to use. It is a general, kind of a broad focus unit. And here we have kind of familiar screen now. Upper right hand is the default main screen. And then we have the three screens around it that are showing everything in that side toolbar or the side drawer. And the ones that I use a lot, some of them are going to be found on the main screen already. The map, the where to, the trip computer, and mark waypoint. I do use all those. Those are I generally keep those up on my main screen. And then the profile change I, I tend to add on as well as track manager and waypoint manager. Those are normally on the main screen. Other ones that I find pretty useful that we'll go into more detail on is setup. We already had a whole video on that. The share wirelessly is, is a handy one. The site and go, the satellite and compass also have um, some good use even for the motorcyclist. So We'll dive in a little bit further now, and this is an example of how I've set up my main menu on my Garmin Montana, and as I mentioned, a lot of the things that I talked about, I added on here. The only one that was kind of a, one that wasn't covered is the Verb Remote. The Verb is Garmin's series of action cameras, sort of like a GoPro, but the neat thing is they do talk to a lot of the GPSs, and and. In this case, it allows you to turn it on and off using your GPS screen. So it's it's kind of a slick integration thing. And if you have a Montana, at least some of the older verbs use the same battery. So it gave you kind of a battery charging capability on the go. But we'll go through these different applications one by one here. These are the core ones that really want to hit on and that most of us are going to find the most useful. First one's going to be the map. And this is going to be the screen that you're probably going to spend the most time on. So when you're doing any sort of navigation, this is going to show you where you are in the world. Um, in this case, it's going to be the little blue arrow. I have the side data fields there. And then, as I mentioned, there is a shortcut to the setup menu, which is going to be the three little arrows on the side. So I'll get back to that big menu where you can change orientation and a lot of stuff. If you want to change what's on those small data fields, you just click on it and it'll pull up all your options to go through there. They're broken down by kind of their rough function, or you can hide it all together by just hitting the arrow to collapse it to the right. And one that, uh, kind of a neat feature that it has, and one that sometimes, especially if you're trying to adjust zoom while you're going down the trail or something, if for some reason you find yourself, if you're in a track up or a north up and you're no longer in the center of the screen Garmin does allow you to pan around on the map you can zoom out and scoot it about which is is nice if you want to see something further down the trail but it will allow you to ride off the map you don't have to be on it so if for some reason you have data fields up and you don't have any options for them you probably accidentally pan the screen my general rule of thumb is if you see that on the bottom screenshot here, the bottom left hand corner, you have a little back arrow. And if you're on the map screen and you see a back arrow, it means you're in the panning mode and you're probably going to drive off the screen at some point. So, really important one. It's a really common question. I, I know I ran into it when I was new with the unit and I'd scroll around or something or even I, you know, miss a zoom, you know, thought I hit the zoom button and missed it and then all of a sudden I'm driving off the screen. So, Real important one here, if you are using the map screen and you see that back arrow, hit it and it'll center you back up. Another important one that we do cover kind of in the uh, navigating with tracks tips and tricks, but we'll touch on it again, is zoom level. And I recommend on a motorcycle, if you're navigating with tracks or even just generally doing a top-down view, uh, I'd stay between the, the 300 foot and two-tenths of a mile scale. Generally, I'm probably more... 500 or 800 foot if I'm doing more technical off-road and then two tenths of a mile and I'm even sometimes now pushing to, to half mile scale if I'm doing faster stuff uh, more on the road or something like that 300 foot scale is nice if you are riding 
you know, single track or something super technical. Uh, the two tenths of a mile scale, I kind of put as a back marker for myself is at that, once you go to half mile scale, you start losing a lot of the side roads with the auto zoom levels that are built in. So that's only where I stay if I still want to see all the really small side roads, if I'm not just blasting through. Uh, the good thing about picking one or two of these, or even if you're just bouncing between these four, is your mind will get used to the scale you're working in. So I do recommend, you know, if you're going out and doing a BDR, doing top down, do five or 800 foot, maybe bounce between them, but it's really hard with the touchscreen units going down a trail to hit the zoom button accurately and not change screens or something like that so I've personally made it a habit not to zoom while I'm moving or adjust my zoom level while I'm moving so I find that somewhere in this range is going to be a good balance on seeing further enough ahead as well as getting the detail level that you want and all that so pick some try to you know stick stick with it a while and you know you, you can zoom out further but anything beyond I'd say half mile scale you're going to give up a lot of detail and unless you're just blasting down the freeway or something, I don't recommend it. But you have a lot of options. Play with them. This is just my my experience in the last bunch of years where I like to live and uh, take it for what it's worth. So next we're going to move over to where to. And if you have City Navigator installed, you'll be able to search like you would on any GPS for gas stations or all these things you have listed and you can customize this list you can reorganize it I normally like to keep gas stations uh, and in intersections and cities kinda of to the top uh, it's always best where this is a very good GPS unit but it compared to your smartphone it, it is very very slow so if you know you're looking for a gas station rather than searching every, all POIs if you go down to gas station, it'll be faster because it's searching through less stuff. For this to really work the way that you expect it to work, you do need a routable map, which means either City Navigator or a 24K topo map. Uh, I do recommend having City Navigator if you're doing motorcycle things just because it's going to give you all the points of interest and give you turn-by-turn -turn instructions. But yeah, you can change this as you see fit. Then we're going to move on to profile change. So uh, we've talked a bit about profiles and how it's great. You can build them to do different things. Profile change is going to pop up a menu and it'll give you your list of all your profiles. And you just bounce between the ones that you want. Up top it'll tell you which one you're on and then you can select the one that you want to change to. Now back to the main screen here. Trip computer. A trip computer is one that I found myself using a lot when especially commuting, stuff where I don't care about the actual navigation. A lot of times dirt biking, I'll have it up because I don't really care where I am. I'm running trails. I know that I'm recording my breadcrumbs and all that, so I, I can find my way back out. But having the different information up is handy. You do have a lot of information you put up here. And on this screen, you can keep adding to it. So where this has two pages worth of trip trip data uh, information, you can have more. So I've had it before where maybe total time is multiple times on there because I want a different six pack of information, but I might want the same thing in a couple. So unless you repeat it, you could have all six be the same thing. Don't know why you'd want to do that, but they do give you that option where it is that customizable. And to change any of those trip computer fields, you just touch on the field. So if you wanted to make moving average, Temperature, if you had a temperature sensor hooked up, you could click, uh, press on that and it would give you all your options. If you do hit the menu button on the side of those three lines on the left-hand side, this is where I mentioned before you have the that reset shortcut, and that's where it is here. And then you can, uh, they do give you different dashboards, so I know of value. Uh, I haven't used any other ones, this is the one I always use, but you can set it up where you just have two big data fields. So you can have kind of like a cap heading for rally navigation type stuff. Uh, you can also lock the data fields so you're not adjusting them on the fly. Uh, so that is that. And then here's a, just a list of everything that you can do with the trip computer. So I've highlighted the ones that I use, and some of them are repeated. And as you can see, there are some that are kind of 
not applicable to a motorcycle uh, elevation above ground you're probably not that far above the ground and vertical speed things like that but there are a lot of good ones uh, some of them you kind of don't think of the uh, sunrise sunset I, it can be a handy one especially if you're doing something like a backcountry discovery route where you're going to be camping and the sun, if you're in the mountains, can disappear fast once it gets over the crest there. So knowing when the sun's going to go down is uh, can be a handy one to have. So you, you go, oh, man, I only get I only get an hour. I better uh, you know start thinking about finding a camp instead of uh, I just lost the th sun. I'm going to be setting up camp in the dark. And But this is the list um, as of a couple of years ago, and I don't think they've added anything. But you get a lot of options. Not all of them you'll use, but... There they are. And then moving on now, we're going to go to Mark Waypoint. And waypoints are really pretty awesome where it is just a latitude and longitude point. And I use these a lot if I'm riding the dirt bike and parking on the trailhead. I mark the trailhead. Um, if I break down when I'm on a ride, I can mark where I left the bike so I can go get it later. There, You know... I've been riding out and find a really cool camp spot. I'm not ready to camp, but I'll mark it for, you know, just to kind of have in my quiver of camp spots for an area and go out and find it again later. So they're really great. We use them too. I guess the other one is a lot when riding in the early season uh, and you're finding the down trees and everything as areas open up. And if you're doing trail maintenance, it's nice. You can, you know, go out and ride four service roads on a street legal dirt bike that you can just get around the trees and then come back later. Um, you know, obviously with appropriate permits from the forest service to clear down debris and stuff like that. So you can kind of go do a big loop, find, okay, well, we need to come back in this slid on the single track or there's a tree across the trail and, and go back and fix it. So, Waypoints are awesome that way. The nice thing, too, where this is a touchscreen unit opposed to some of the older ones where I'd always mark a waypoint with a number, then go back and I'd make a note in my notebook, and then when I got on the computer, I'd update it to something that made more sense, is when you hit mark waypoint, you'll get that top screen there, and if you hit edit, you'll get that bottom one. So you can select what icon you want. You can rename it. You can even make additional notes. You just want to make sure you hit save when you're done. Otherwise, it will just not save it. And it won't say, do you not want to save this? It will just back out of it. So the one time you don't get the screen that warns you, you, you know, is when it would be nice to have it. So make sure you hit save. If you do hit, you can see when you're, you've selected to edit it in that bottom editing screen, you do have a menu option. And it does give you some options here. Uh, most of these I don't use. The The one that I have used before is average location. And if you're doing geocaching or you're trying to, you know, you're going to want to find an exact spot, not like a field or a campsite, but you want to find a rock or a tree, you can put the GPS down next to it and you hit average location and you leave it there for five minutes or so and it just keeps pinging all the satellites it's going to get you an extremely accurate location where it's probably within a foot or so. Um, I know years ago when I was taking a surveying class in college, the Forest Service folks were talking about where they've started doing this where for that type of work where if plus or minus a couple feet or a foot is close enough, they're using that instead of the really expensive surveying ones that they didn't need for doing uh, – a timber sale or something so it is a neat one if you are doing scavenger hunts and you're burying stuff or you want stuff to be super findable definitely put it down in average location the rest of the stuff I haven't really used but um, again when you back out of this or you average location you back out make sure you hit save or you're gonna uh, not save any of that stuff all right now we're gonna move it on to the track manager and tracks are something that we do use a lot. So you're going to have both your current track, which is that breadcrumb trail behind you. And then when that gets full, either by you having it set up to save daily or once the file's full, it will become an archive track. And then you can import save tracks as well, which would be 
three on the bottom. The first two were archive tracks that were brought into a different GPS unit. So that's the format they'd be as an archive track. They would be a date and a time. And then below that is just something that's been named. And the backcountry discovery routes and the Tortec rallies will use tracks as something to, to navigate because it is completely repeatable. These are just a series of latitude and longitude points that make a line that you can follow. So we'll start off with the current track and we go to the track manager. And this is another one where one of the few changes between the older first generation units, the Montana 600 and 650, and then the newer 610 and 680. And I really wish Garmin would do a firmware update and bring everything to the new style because it is a lot nicer of an interface. But I have a feeling they're going to try to make all of us guys with the old ones come up to the new units. But you're, you do get the same information through either one. So your current track, you have the option of saving the track or saving a portion. You can view the map. You get the elevation plot, set the color, and then clear it. And if you were writing something and you wanted to start something new, if you, if you saved it, then it'll kind of give you that hard cutoff, even if you're set to save every day. You're halfway through the day, and you're like, I'm starting a new thing. I want this to be its own track from start to finish. That's where you do that. Save portion, I've never really bothered to use, but it would let you go in and kind of grab whatever section. The view map is going to be sort of like what you're seeing on the right hand side of the screen that the newer units do where it gives you that overview map so instead of having just the list you have to select on it it does give you the option to see an overview map and then if you clicked up to the eye it would give you that elevation plot type information written out and then the bottom would be the elevation plot so you do get the same on either side um, generally with your current track the only thing you're going to do with it is, is save it um, I haven't really found a reason while well, using the GPS in the field to look at my elevation plot or something like that generally you're just saving it so you can cut off and get a fresh start now we go back to the track manager and this is what people you do more often they have imported save tracks like in this case well, we can look at the uh, 0 2 dash Stone Valley Loop, which was a ride at the, I believe, 2016 Tour Tech Rally East. And when you click over onto it, again, we get the split screen, and you're going to want to show that on the map. The view map is going to be similar to what that bottom screen on the right hand side, or we can jump over here, and it's just an overview map. It's just there for, so you can confirm, yep, this is the track that I want, this is the area that I want to ride, and then you can go and go back and show it on the map. Uh, so again, we get a lot of options, elevation plot. If you're bicycling, you'd probably care about that. <laughs> on a motorcycle, you don't. Show on map is the one you're going to use. You're going to click show on map, and then you're going to select a color that's going to have good contrast on the next one. On the newer units on the right hand side you can see where it's got a switch to say show on map and an on off and then the color you can select and I do recommend having something that has good contrast I normally use red or purple uh, there's magenta that pops pretty well green is not really a good good color especially if you're using a topo map uh, going back through the list of options here you can delete it you can rename it again these are things that you don't normally do on the GPS itself and we'll, we've kind of touched a bit on this if you watch the earlier video on navigating with tracks tips and tricks when it comes to colors and things like that we really dive into a lot of examples on that but you want something that's going to contrast well and the other big thing is when you show it on the map you want to you're going to want to back up to your main map screen and navigate there this preview map that you get the view map that is just to preview to make sure that's what you want to be showing on the map that map was not going to pan with you or anything that is just an overview so you're going to go back to your main screen go back to your map hopefully you're at, at some point on that track and then you just follow the line now we'll go back to the nav or the applications here the verbal remote we touched on that's just a cool little thing Garmin has if you're using one of their cameras 
and then Waypoint Manager is going to be the other one. So we talked about marking a waypoint and how they're handy because it's a location you can find again. And the Waypoint Manager is just going to list all of them. And the do, they do let you sort it a different way. The bottom screen is using that side menu. And you can search by the name or symbol or search near. So it generally defaults by whatever is closest to you which if you're trying to go through them as you're at home and you're going to do a trip a thousand miles away, it can be kind of a pain. When you're actually out there using the GPS, it is super functional because you're probably looking for stuff relatively close to you and you probably don't have 300 waypoints that you've, you've set up. So that's how you can search through it. And you can search by the symbols. And I do use the different symbols a lot when I'm setting them up where even on this one, there's a gas station that I have marked out that have had used a bunch and photo point and restaurant and stuff like that so it is a, a good tool and if you are using waypoints it does let you find and navigate to them easily and that's the end of the, the core applications some of the other ones that don't even have up on the main screen but are kind of neat the share wire wirelessly one if somebody else has a Garmin Montana or any of the outdoor units the Zumos use a different technology so you can't go from Montana to a Zumo but you can go between the Zumos and most of the handheld GPS's unless you send and receive tracks as well as waypoints and obviously it's better to set it up on the computer ahead of time but if I've had it cases before where I'm out on a ride and somebody has a you know, meets up with me halfway through we're a couple of days in and we found out there's a slide on the next section we're going to ride and he had the workaround already transfer that track and then it worked out well for everybody because you know we're, we all have the most up-to-date information you know another one is you know if you run you know you have your campsite set up and you meet your buddy in town he's going to go set up his tent while you guys have another you know go do some shopping or whatever you can give him that waypoint without having to type in a big address so it's a handy one. It's not one you use often, but it is does come in handy. Uh, the next one is going to be the Sight and Go, which is going to be on the bottom left hand there. And if you've done any sort of old school map and compass navigation and doing the, you know, where you shoot an azimuth and you got to walk that way, the Sight and Go is nice because you can take a bearing, you can lock it, and then it's going to stay the same. So if you have to walk around a tree it'll kind of pull you back to it. So not something you're going to use on a bike, but if you were doing, you know, orienteering type stuff, it, it does give a really neat feature that I wish my compass back in the Marines had when you're trying to go through rough terrain and you, you know what tree you're aiming for or what peak and lets you kind of keep on that even if maybe you can't see that land feature anymore. Uh, another one is kind of the traditional one that all the, the older GPS's had and the outdoor ones keep is your satellites and unless you see how many satellites you're talking to and you have reception with it doesn't you know your GPS accuracy shows you the same sort of information but it is kinda neat to see all the satellites and what you're talking with and then the bottom is the electronic compass and the Montana does have a proper electronic compass so it's doesn't need you to be moving to know what it's doing. It is, you know, a full featured altimeter, barometer, compass unit. So it is a proper outdoor unit. You do have a real compass in it. So that is something that's really neat that the Zumo series and the automotive units don't have. You still have all that traditional outdoor functionality. Stuff that I don't normally use that often other than the send and receive, but it's kind of neat functions that are there. All right, so that wraps up the class. If you have any questions, definitely feel free to give us a call, 1-800-491-2926, and check out the website, tortech-usa.com. If you need anything for your adventure bike, we can get you all set up and ready for your next adventure. And thanks for watching.